Um, so we're reorganizing a couple of our television and film panels after that great presentation by David Pierce. Uh, many of the people whose work we have heard from and cited during this conference, Richard Stallman, Steve Weber, Jim Sawicki, Terry Fisher, and others, imagine in uh, their writings and talks an alternative reality, or several kind of different alternative realities, that are not exactly utopian in the sense that it is nowhere. And uh, uh, these alternative realities are not altogether impossible to achieve or get to either. As we hear about new activities uh, in the UK, um, in Europe as a whole, in France as a, an individual country, in Denmark, um, and in Brazil, where Terry Fisher's uh, latest book covers a tremendous amount of ground. But it is still some alternative place, and I think we need to keep that kind of long-term, distant, um, uh, optimistic vision certainly in mind. But I do believe that we ourselves can manage to affect change, um, especially in the way that we move forward in producing media, and especially um, in the way we move forward producing so-called educational or, or public media. In uh, 1977, a young professor of architecture at MIT published uh, an essay in the Quarterly Review of Film Studies titled, New Possibilities in Film at the University. That author, Ed Pincus, is here in the room today. He went on to launch the MIT Film Studies program with Ricky Leacock and worked with his contemporaries, the Maisels brothers, Frederick Wiseman, D.A. Pennebaker, and others. He trained legions of filmmakers working in our universe today, and he produced with a social and political eye groundbreaking documentaries on subjects as verily painful as the Black South and marriage. Ed wrote in his essay that he, quote, would like to present the meaning for film of the technological breakthroughs some 15 years ago that defined what came to be called cinema verite and the possibilities that these open for film production at the university. I think that this challenge falls again to us today. It seems to me that what we should do is assemble, perhaps, with the legal, business, production, financial, archival, and consulting sensibilities represented at this meeting, a, a set of open educational resources that are on video and film. Materials that have an affinity, to use Jim Sawicki's word, with the pedagogical agenda. While we wrestle and struggle and fund the conversion and clearance of previously produced so-called legacy content, perhaps we can focus some more attention on creating and producing new materials today based at the university, based at the library, based at the museum. Kadi Geber identified Chin as an executive producer, after all, today. Let's build, to use the language loosely, I guess, uh, open source documentary assets for education and culture. I won't quote for you the statistics that uh, about media, the media use of teenagers today and their excitement to work producing media, but we certainly need to get a handle on it. We need to harness that energy, the creative energy, the collaborative energy, the student and teacher energy, and the excitement of specialists in archiving media in the university and outside of it. To some degree, a number of us are doing this already, building what we at Intelligent Television formally call open production initiatives. For example, we are spinning key elements off of a major three-hour program on the Suez Canal crisis that we are producing in association with uh, the BBC and with resources at News Film Online that David Dawson spoke of into the BBC Creative Archive for people to rip, mix, and burn. But this project, although it is kind of a, it's a crucial subject, it's an account of a botched Western invasion of the Middle East exactly 50 years ago, is not something that we essentially control. And the BBC Creative Archive, for now at least, has geographical limits as to its use, restricting that use by intent, if not always in practice, 
uh, restricting access to its rich base of materials to UK-based users and IP addresses. So what if we were to produce a new documentary as a test? My friend and partner Alex Gibney, uh, who directed Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, The Trials of Henry Kissinger, uh, produced The Blues and the Pacific Century for PBS. He and I are producing a new documentary on the history of the Korean War with historian David Halberstam, whose new book on the subject comes out in 2007. I mean, could you imagine producing this type of film in an open environment? Uh, it's a subject that's essential. Uh, it could be produced uh, and cleared properly with testimonies from the veterans on all sides of that conflict, with the survivors, with the people from that time, and the reels of footage, many of which are in the public domain, around the world from the war. And if that's too broad for all of us to imagine, then what if we were to fund and produce, using the same power of the camera lens and the microphone and digital technology, educational materials for learning? Um, there are three cam uh, cameras filming this meeting right now, robotically, through a brilliant, small, and efficient system designed by Craig Milanese and his crew at MIT Video, who will be the first group that we thank at the end of this meeting. The cost of recording and miking this event may amount to $7,000, maybe less given that I've just plugged MIT Video, uh, the best video production unit. Uh, that comes out to about $500 an hour for producing this. And the value of this material that we are taping, I think, is huge. So today, uh, what we will do is hear from producers of educational material in the academy and in public broadcasting. Jay Fialkov is joining us from WGBH on this panel, as opposed to the one after lunch, because he has um, an engagement uh, and, and needs to present now. But first, um, let me introduce Frank Moretti and John Frankfurt from Columbia. Thank you. Uh, hi. My name is Frank Moretti. I'm the executive director of the Columbia Center for New Media Teaching and Learning. And, um, I'd like to begin by inviting you to our conference, which is this Friday. Uh, it's at Lowe Library at Columbia University. If you happen to be in New York or of New York, uh, please feel free to come. It's a full day of demonstrations and presentations by faculty members of the university that have worked with us on different kinds of educational interventions. I'm going to try to give my introduction in cable uh, so that we can move quickly to some active demonstrations. Uh, my favorite teacher in college was a, a professor of American uh, studies who uh, got way behind in his syllabus. And so he got to the last day, and he began the class by saying, well, we're up to Melville. Uh, the book is Moby Dick. It's a story about a whale. So I'll try to be really quick in introducing what we do. Um, the, we're a service organization in the university. We basically partner with faculty, with deans, with uh, with program directors, with departmental chairmen, in developing either simple interventions like building web courses with faculty, web-based uh, web uh, environments for the faculty using the course management system. We do consulting uh, to help people think about how to organize their digital media strategies within the university. And we build uh, web-based applications that are much more serious and elaborate educational interventions. Uh, with all the schools, uh, all 18 schools. We, we build simulations with environmental science, heart simulators with the medical school, case studies with people in journalism and the School of International and Public Affairs and, uh, and social work. Uh, we build uh, multimedia publication environments that uh, support a number of different educational programs. and. Probably some of our most innovative work has been done in building tools like the image annotation tool and the video interaction for teaching and learning environment that uh, John is going to demonstrate uh, for you today. 
I would direct you to our website uh, as a place where you can actually get access to the vast majority of things we've developed and done. And if, in fact, for some reason it doesn't allow you to get into a particular tool or environment, you should just email us directly and we'll give you access to it. We protect certain things uh, for a variety of reasons that are related to the subject of this conference. Uh, we are uh, part of information services at the university, which means that our cousins are the librarians. And so we have a number of projects that are directly in collaboration with the librarians. One of our most recent projects that we're just incubating at the present time is the creation of a multimedia archive of uh, digital resources that are that's related to the culture and history of Harlem and we're partnering with a range of internal collaborators the history department the oral uh, the oral history group at the university the institute for research in african american studies a number of community based organizations that are providing collections and assets and with our friend peter uh, intelligent television and what our hope is to develop simultaneously a multimedia archive that will have a number of educational expressions, both at the university, K-12 education, uh, a, uh, a documentary film, perhaps even kiosks that support learning in different kinds of community technology centers. So with that as an introduction, we really want to spend most of our time demonstrating some of the things we do and then probably uh, elaborate on uh, what we're about in the question and answer period. So uh, I present to you Dr. John Frankfurt, a colleague from the center, who will do those demonstrations. First of all, here is uh, the website that Frank was speaking about, if you're interested to find out more information. We also uh, have a bag full of literature and information about the center, and we'll be wondering about eventually getting our lunch as well, so you can find out uh, more about us uh, in a one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> conversation. Uh, as Frank mentioned, the online tools that we develop are for classroom use. Uh, for faculty that come to us that we begin, begin a conversation with, and they have varying levels of sophistication. Uh, we're funded by the university, uh, by grants, on occasion by individuals, and uh, maybe we'll elaborate on that more during the question and answer. Uh, the three projects that we're going to be showing now uh, all have a great deal of video content, uh, in keeping with the spirit of the title of this panel, uh, video derived from film, video derived from television. Uh, with each of these projects, uh, our challenge, or I think what we were interested in, was not, not necessarily the collection or the archiving of these materials, but uh, making this media purposeful, in some way purposeful in the classroom. And uh, I think that's in keeping with our main mission and why our emphasis, or, uh, or why we're here, is more about uh, the use. I think Howard was right talking about uh, usability. And that's something that we're extremely interested in, and that's really where we feel our expertise falls, as opposed to uh, figuring out uh, copyright questions uh, and the like. So we're going to see uh, very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, three projects where the usability of the media increases in sophistication, or the, the level of interactivity increase. Uh, the first one I want to show is the film language glossary. which we developed in collaboration with the School of the Arts at Columbia University, specifically with uh, Richard Pena, who is also the program director at Lincoln Center. And Professor Pena teaches an introduction to film studies class, and he uses a variety of clips. Uh, he covers a variety of terms, uh, technical, historical, theoretical. Uh, so our conversation began with providing a resource for those students that he could integrate into the class, not simply as a link that they could go to, but things that, uh, terms that he could hopefully assign throughout the semester. Uh, we began this with Professor Pena about a year ago, and because this is an online environment, we have the advantage of making this more organic as opposed to the traditional print glossary where you might spend 10 years 
uh, writing it and then finally releasing it uh, with uh, various upgrades. This is uh, more organic. So the first iteration of the glossary had, I think, only 10 terms. Uh, this iteration has uh, 69 terms. Uh, so the next iteration, uh, hopefully, we, uh, we hope to double that. Um, you'll see some of the terms that you have available here in the drop-down menu, such as camera movement. Uh, let me log in. And this is a good thing that you're seeing the login. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is available for the uh, community at Columbia. If you're off campus, you can't get in unless uh, you talk to us. The terms are written by the faculty members of the film studies department. So they're providing the content. And they're also uh, providing the consultation in terms of what clips uh, they want to make available to the students. So very basically, you'd be reading through a term, uh, getting some sense, in this case, of camera movement, its early development, and then eventually you'd come upon a clip which you could watch in correspondence with that term. Uh, the theory, very simply, is that students will better understand the term if they're able to associate a clip uh, with that term. So as you see here, you have the play clip button. You'd click on play clip, and you'd be able to watch it. tell you how it ends, but I think you can figure it out. Uh, this is one way to access uh, all the terms through the drop-down menu. Uh, the terms are also available in a film term index. As I mentioned, this is a growing resource, uh, so I think there's some letters that are unaccounted for, but we're doing our best to get them all in there. But you'll see a list of all the terms here as well. Uh, and this is another way to access it. And this is a theme that I think will come up in the three projects that we demo. Uh, different. Uh, uh, ways to make the resources available to the user so that if a different instructor or a student comes along, they have different strategies for approaching it. They're not locked into this path and they must go down it in order to find every single resource that they want to uh, use in their research. So for example, you'd find the 180 degree rule. And once again, you find that setup, the term written and embedded in the term are clips. And just as I was explaining that to better understand the clip, you associate uh, the term, you associate the clip with the term. We also added this additional functionality of commentary, annotated commentary. And you see here a menu very much like a DVD menu. We think there's a culture of use, so people wouldn't be surprised to see this. Um, and you could actually choose to watch the clip on its own terms, or you could watch the clip with annotated commentary. We're going to watch a little bit with the annotated commentary by uh, Professor Pena. One of the most commonly used and frequently cited rules or practices of classical filmmaking is the 180 degree rule. The 180 degree rule imagines that there's some kind of invisible axis between the camera and the players who are being filmed. The camera will always stay on one side of that axis and the players will always stay on the other. The belief was if the camera crossed that axis and went to the other side, suddenly people would switch positions. That is, people on the right would now appear on the left and vice versa. This is a practice that was established probably in Hollywood or in Western Europe, sometime in the early part of the 20th century. Now, uh, you'll notice here there's a checkbox. So if you've heard enough or you don't want to hear anything at all and just want to watch the clip, you can actually toggle off uh, the commentary. And this is not simply if, if, you've, if you've only heard enough. But once again, if you're using it in a different context, perhaps you're not teaching the 180 degree term, but you are teaching something about Japanese cinema from this period, you could go to the film glossary and use the clip uh, for that purpose as opposed to teaching uh, what sometimes is called the golden rule of, of film production. Likewise, just like there are many ways to find the terms, uh, there's also several different ways you can access the clip. There's a film clip index. And this is where it starts to look more like a library archive. And I should mention that in addition to collaborating with the film department, we're working with uh, the Columbia University Library, particularly uh, the media library. So they're very interested in this project. And you'll find all of the available clips here, which you can uh, search through ascending or descending by the film title, by the director, by the year is produced. And also, if you want to see every single one that has commentary, you could do that as well. Opening the clips, you can see any of them, but also at the bottom of the clip, 
it can take you back to the term, so it can re-anchor you if you actually went through the film clip index and you want to see the actual term that is associated with. So that's the very quick uh, demonstration of the first tool. Uh, the next one I want to show is the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, this was done in collaboration with Professor Manny Marable of the Center for Contemporary Research in African American Studies, or previously IRIS, Institute for Research in African American Studies. And this was a three-year project uh, and this, I want to log in once again. Which was part of a much larger enterprise. Uh, Professor Marable received a grant from the provost's office uh, and the Malcolm X project. One of the main things was what's going to be, he hopes, the definitive biography of Malcolm X. But in doing that research with his team of researchers, he also decided that he wanted to build an online resource around the autobiography for uh, the class he teaches every year that focuses entirely on the text of the autobiography. The first thing you notice is you have the whole text of the autobiography available to students in the course from the first chapter all the way to the epilogue and the like. And the way a multimedia study environment works very quickly is you have what we call a spine text. And in the spine text, you have these terms which look like hyperlinks. And these links act as annotations, annotations around terms, people, places, things, ideas. So I could click on the term Elijah Muhammad, which appears in, the chap in chapter 14. He appears throughout the text. And then you'd get an annotation about him. These annotations were written by Professor Marable's uh, graduate researchers. Embedded in that annotation, though, you also have multimedia. So here again, we return to uh, uses of video. First, we just have slideshows which were acquired by a team of media researchers. In addition to that, we have uh, archival video as well as uh, oral histories, which I'll get to in a moment. And here's an interview with uh, Elijah Muhammad from CBS News. The white race is doomed and that they are a race of devils. Do you make any distinction? Are there any good white people? For example, suppose I were to ask you whom you think is the best white man. Is there any such thing? I let the Bible answer that. He says, no, not one is good. So just to give it, we have uh, over 400 annotations throughout the autobiography. We're looking at just one right now and one clip that exists in there. But once again, you have a variety of strategies from which you can access this uh, these materials. So you could go through the entire text, or as the chapters are being assigned to, you could find those annotations as the annotations are assigned to. But you could also find all of the multimedia assets in this index that we created. And these have been organized, too, based on the speeches of Malcolm X, the various archival footage that we have, uh, the commentary. We uh, conducted interviews with people who knew Malcolm X during his lifetime, and also scholars uh, on Malcolm X and civil rights, et cetera. Press clippings, uh, the FBI files. Uh, as we know, there's an extensive FBI file on Malcolm X, and the image gallery. Once again, you could sort these based on the date, ascending or descending, uh, the location where the speech was given, uh, the name of the speech, uh, the title, and also the media type of media. In this case, for the Malcolm X speeches, we have audio files and we have video files. So for example, if you are curious in this environment to see what is the most recent interview uh, that they have, we have on Malcolm X, you would find it here towards the end of his life after his second trip uh, to uh, Africa. Wherein all the power used to be centered in Europe, it's not centered in Europe anymore. It has divided itself up and is in centered in different parts of this earth today. Much of it is in Asia. Much of it is in Africa. And as I mentioned, in addition, we have this commentary section. And here's where you find interviews that we conducted in the production of this project with either contemporaries of Malcolm X or scholars on him as well. And this becomes almost like an oral history project as well. So for example, you'd find Ossie Davis, uh, who knew Malcolm X during his lifetime, talking about Malcolm X's role in the civil rights movement. And reaching out 
to the civil rights leaders in the 64 uh, was expressing his own commitment to struggle and to his people. Malcolm, part of his greatness was that wherever truth was, Malcolm would go there, even if it cut off his own legs. So he wasn't afraid. So that's another type of media asset. Finally, uh, in this environment, we have this uh, area called the thematic section. And here is where we actually captured class lectures uh, conducted by Professor Marable, uh, the faculty producer of this site, uh, on themes that he's focusing on for his own uh, biography of Malcolm X. And the four themes that we captured for this uh, environment is on the assassination, the uh, Haley-X relationship, in terms of who is truly the author, Malcolm X women and gender, Malcolm X's political thought and legacy. You can open up any of these and see the lecture in its entirety, but you also have an outline. Uh, and most significantly, too, once again, the assets that I was briefly highlighting are, again, repurposed. Uh, so, for example, one of the things if you went to this uh, point in the lecture where he talks about the actual uh, shooting of Malcolm X, you could also find uh, corresponding images. But the user, in fact, has control over what images they can look at. And so they're creating a narrative alongside uh, the narrative that Professor Marable occurs. is teaching about this It's about a this third day. of the way back in the auditorium. Someone says, take your hands out of my pocket. The two men begin to scuffle. All eyes turn around to the center of the disturbance. The security men who have been positioned throughout the auditorium leave their sites and begin to go toward the site of the conflict. That's a, Malcolm's a very quick version of it, but the idea is that you go to these things and it's not simply locking you into some uh, certain idea or, or theory. Uh, in this case, Professor Marables, you should be able to go in there, use this as a type of archive, create new types of knowledge. Uh, when you're in there, like, uh, and perhaps and, uh, use it in many different courses as well, not simply the Malcolm X uh, seminar that Professor Marable teaches. The final thing I want to show is vital. Now, in this case, uh, you have a large repository of video but the students uh, have the ability to look at that video and quote video segments into their class papers. If you can imagine uh, the traditional way of you quote an article, uh, a sentence, or a paragraph, or you quote a book, uh, it's the same principle with uh, the VITAL tool. And VITAL is being designed to be an extensible tool, meaning that we want it to be used across many classes, and that's already happened. It came out of developmental mathematics. It's been used in uh, counseling. It's been used in sociology. The one I'm going to show you is from a dance course. Um, I'm using it for my own class on avant-garde cinema. Uh, so this idea of clipping and quoting and what you should look for in particular clips, we feel is something that can be repurposed across uh, many disciplines. The first thing you notice in the tool is you'll find the digital library. In this case, for the dance studies course taught by Mark Franco, uh, his class is a survey of modern dance in the 20th century, and you'll find all the clips. Once again, uh, you can sort by title, by year, and when you open each clip, this is where you have the ability to actually uh, clip the clip, so to speak, and do uh, uh, prepare for your final paper. The video will upload. And as you watch the video, as you watch the video, you notice you have this start time and end time here. Throughout uh, the screening that you're doing in your own individual workspace, if we get the volume down a little bit, you can click on endpoints that you want to have and out points, waiting for those moments that you think are going to be crucial for your own study. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to decide that this is what I want. You give it a title, uh, an easy one, clip one. But also, you have a note card. This is notes because, in all likelihood, you're taking a variety of clips for your final paper, much like if you're going to the library, you're pulling every single book you can get your hands on related to your paper topic. So you might want to put in some note. Uh, use for conclusion or something like that. Uh, and hopefully something more extensive than that. I go to the Save Selection, and the clip is put into my own personal workspace. 
and I can continue to do this over and over and over again. I'm going to go to my workspace now to show you what I'm talking about. And if you notice, I've been working on this final paper for a long time. So uh, in order to sort of orient myself and figure out how many clips I can grab, and once again, we have the sorting function, so I can sort and find the most recent clip that I added. And if I wanted to, I could take a look at it to remind myself and also look at the notation that I put in my workspace to see why exactly I grabbed that clip. Here, then, you see the paper that I'm working on. Sort of narrow space here. And in fact, what you can do is you can add that section, uh, that clip, to your paper. This is the paper, and we have the Add button here. My note was Add to Conclusion. I hit the Add, and it goes into my final paper. Final papers, then, will look very much like papers we're accustomed to seeing uh, in a Word document, only in this case, they're going to be uh, the clips as well. I can open a student's paper, and you'll see that. Final paper using the vital tool. You read throughout, and every once in a while, you'll come across these links. These are the links that this particular student grabbed for her final paper. The professor could read this and see the argument the student's making, and then open up that clip and once play the clip off uh, the argument the student is trying to make here. Now, of course, uh, in terms of grades, uh, notations, if there are comments the professor wants to give, there's still some traditional methods to be followed. You print it out, you hand back the grade, or you could email your comments. But uh, most importantly is this ability to quote and add quotations, uh, video quotations throughout uh, the paper. So that's uh, the, uh, the fast and furious demonstration of a number of tools. So I think now we're going to go on to our next presentation. Thank you.